Welcome to the LA Soccer Hub Show. My name is Gio Garcia. Today is Thursday, December 17th, a day after LAFC beat Cruz Azul, the second league IMX team. It was a thriller, man. They were down, uh, down one goal in the first half, and then Carlos Vela scores that penalty, and then Mahala comes and saves the day. Exciting game, exciting uh, game for the LAFC fans and everybody involved in the MLS because this is the last MLS team left in the CONCACAF Champions League. And here to t help me talk about it all, we got... Uh, Katya Castarena from ESPN. Katya, how are you doing? Hi, Dio. All good. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Happy to be here to talk about the game. Definitely was an exciting one. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was like I said, exciting. Got a thriller. Like I said, the last MLS team uh, left in CONCACAF. So, you know, you and I, we've been, we've been covering the team, um, you know, for the last couple of years. How, how big, I just want to, how big is LAFC in, in, in like in the Mexican and down south of the border uh, with these Liga MX teams in the, in the country of Mexico? Well, of course, the fact that Carlos Vela is on the team has helped a lot to put the team like on the map and to get, you know, that attention. So the factor of Carlos Vela is, is huge because you see it during the, um, the sports casts and just like the the media in general in Mexico, where they actually talk about uh, LAFC, the rivalry with LA Galaxy, even before Chicharito got to LA Galaxy and everything that happened with Slotan, it, it was huge. You know, suddenly there was an interest, and then people in Mexico were watching the games and were interested in what was happening with the MLS, in particular with the El Clásico, eh, El Tráfico, and the rivalry between the LA teams. So that definitely helps, and to get more and more attention. I mean, still the, there's a debate going on, and now uh, with the Concacaf Champions League, where you see uh, the Mexican team against MLS teams and there's always a, a little bit of rivalry in the sense that you know they're trying to see who's better and now that uh, LAFC beat both Leon and Cruz Azul and it kind of like sp spikes up the conversation again and the debate about well is MLS at that level uh, already or like who's who's the best team who's the you know where's um, where the best teams are at so uh, this is always exciting I mean of course historically and in I mean, not just that the league has been around longer, but also in terms of the championships in, in this particular competition. Well, of course, the Mexican teams have been the champions since 2008, and they have that in their favor. Yeah, they, like you said, the, the Mexican teams have definitely dominated this league. And, you know, just the way how LAFC started, you know, the CONCACAF Champions League against, you know, against Leon, they were down, I think it was like 3 0. And then they come back at Bank of California 2 Stadium. 0, yeah. 2 0, 2 0, come back in Bank of California Stadium and get the win. And, you know, I think we, you know, us covering the team, we knew how the, the talent that this team's had. But I think, you know, once they be, beat Leon at, at Bank of California Stadium, then you, you people realize who Leon is now, the Liga IMX, you know, champion. People realize, OK, you know, LAFC, you know, obviously with Carlos Vela, this this is definitely a team that to take serious. And, you know, obviously the pandemic happened and everything, you know, <clears throat> I think everybody was looking forward to this Azul matchup with LAFC going down to Estadio Azteca, Mexico City. That's unfortunate that that didn't happen, you know, like, you know, they we were able to go yeah. down there and they were to come back, back up here. But, you know, it turns out that we finally had this game versus Cruz Azul. You know, Cruz Azul coming off, you know, a very, you know, drastic, dramatic end to their season, you know, with their head coach designing. Um, you know, and LAFC, the, you know, also, you know, with the type of season that they had this season, wasn't that optimistic for them. But it looked like things were breaking LAFC's way because of the coach design for Cruz Azul. And it looked like Cruz Azul was very, in a very vulnerable spot with no head coach, the COVID cases, you know, and... um. I think LAFC played really well this game. You know, I, I think at times the game was a little bit, a little fast for certain, certain players, but, you know, they did what they were supposed to do. They, they got the 2-1 victory. Um, were you surprised by the way Cruz Azul ended Liga MX uh, the season? And uh, were you surprised at how they played yesterday? I was definitely surprised about the way they ended the Liga MX tournament because, even though this has happened before and it's part of their history and the term Cruz Azulear, but, but because of what we've seen of them during the 2020, not just during this um, uh, tournament, you know how they're like short to, uh, they play two tournaments and 
in one year. But uh, during the beginning of 2020, before it got canceled because of the pandemic, they had been showing great things and they kind of like continued with, with that work towards the end of the season. And, and again, the fans were excited. They had kind of like that faith that maybe this was going to be the year that they were finally going to be able to win again a championship. So it was tough to then see them play that way in, in the second leg against Pumas, the way they went down after having an advantage of four goals, you know, and the, it's, it's incredible. I was surprised about how things went down in, in that game. But then I wasn't that surprised with what happened against LAFC because of what we've seen. It's, of course, very difficult for a team when you've, you know, emo like emotionally and mentally not 100% because of what happened with everything that's been going, or, you know, going on around them and everything that's being said with the coach resigning. I mean, it's very difficult, I guess, uh, to pick up a team when, when they've been through all of these in, in what, uh, the last week. So it, it was tough. Yeah, no, it was it was definitely. I know a lot of people and a lot of fans, and I think even the players wrote a letter to the to the fans. You know that this potential could you know be a redemption game for them, and you know like with everything going on, you know I just felt that LAFC were the slight favorite going going in. You know because you know without their head coach and everything going on, and I think but once the field, even Bob Bradley said this before. He said I think someone asked them, you know, do they feel like they're the favorite or they have an advantage because of that? And Bob Bradley mentioned that you know you earn the you know you earn the advantage or the respect on the field. And to start the game, you know, uh, Cruz Azul, the first couple minutes, I know Diego Rossi had, had, you know, had a shot on goal, but Cruz Azul looked like the better team in the first couple, first couple of minutes. Um, it just looked like the, the ball was rolling a lot better for them. They were a little bit more in sync than LAFC. And I think, like I said earlier, like certain players, they were a step behind or they, I think the game was a little bit quicker um from to, to them to play the way a Cruz Azul played but then you know you you had that that penalty in the in the 15 minute I don't want to get too much into the rest but do you do you feel like that was a, a soft penalty call uh against LAFC uh, I guess it it was the experience of oh the the first one you, you mean the the Cruz Azul one yeah, the a first little one. bit you know we we had our doubts yeah yeah um, I know a little bit we had our, our doubts if, if it been kind of like uh, too harsh in in that sense, but I guess he did get him off balance and then you, you don't have to totally like slam a player, I guess, for it to, to be a penalty. So he determined that it, it was, um, that it did have an effect in, in, in the sense of getting the, the player off balance. So I guess it was okay, but I'd say that LAFC had been the better team because they showed more intensity and they were aggressive from the get-go. Cause you know, they had a couple of really good chances on those first 10 minutes. And then aside from the penalty, Cruz Azul hadn't like done anything to kind of like scare LAFC. So it, it was, I guess, a little bit unfair to see uh, Cruz Azul get ahead when the better team had been LAFC from the get-go. Yeah, no, and Yotun, who the way he took that penalty, just took it with all the confidence and just straight down. I was like, wow, I mean, the type the type of way just to take that penalty. Um, one thing that I guess surprised me a little bit was uh, Kenneth. They got one like that in, in MLS and it didn't go that way. Yeah, I think we may be experiencing a little bit of a lag, but we'll work with it. Uh, just, just for the people who are listening, uh, just a little bit of lag. Just, just, just work with this. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I was gonna say, were you surprised that Kenneth Vermeer started over over Pablo Cisnegas in this game? I was because you know Pablo, you know he he got fit, he came back uh, against Seattle, so I I thought he was gonna be the man. <laughs> to to be there for for LAFC but I, I don't know what Bob Bradley saw during training or perhaps you know kind of what Cruz Azul was doing even before the pandemic it was Jurado the one uh, the goalie that was active for the CONCACAF Champions League while Corona was just like focused for the just focused in the Mexican tournament so I don't know if it was maybe a little bit of that or it was just like competition during practice that maybe Bob Bradley says something of Vermeer that uh, made him make that decision in the sense of maybe security experience. Um, I don't know. 
Yeah, because I we you know even after like I think uh, Pablo Cisnega started the last you know the Seattle Sounders the last the last game for them and you know I was like okay you know Pablo has a number one spot but it seems like it, it there's still competition there with Kenneth Vermeer obviously we don't know if Pablo Cisnega is injured they haven't said anything but another thing I think that surprised me too was uh, Mark Anthony K starting over over Latif Blessing were you were you surprised by Mark Anthony getting that start? No, I was expecting that exact midfield, you know, with the Tuesta, Cifuentes, and Mark Anthony K. You know, K has been one of the leaders for the team. And even though I don't feel like it was his best game yesterday, especially he was imprecise uh, during the first half. Um, you know, he he's an important player for the team, for Bob Bradley, because of the leadership that he's shown. So I was expecting that midfield. Um, I was surprised with Mustaf. I, I know Brian Rodriguez, you know, just flew back after the COVID and what, like Thursday. So he didn't have that much of training under him with the team. But I was except, expecting the um, upfront, you know, Rodriguez, Rossi and, and Bella. So I, I was surprised by that. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think that tells us a lot. Even uh, him, you know Brian Rodriguez not even being the first sub to come in. I think you know with everything I guess he experienced with COVID, uh, you know it's a lot, it's a lot more serious, and he's still not in game shape in order I guess to start for LAFC. But it was good to see him. You know I think he played about ten you know ten fifteen minutes. It was good to see him come in come off the bench and get that start. Um, what do you think about Carlos Vela? Do you do you feel like he's a, he's like I know Bob Bradley said he's not at full form, but he is looking really really close to the full form that we saw before this pandemic and before his injury. Definitely, I do feel like he's getting closer and closer. I mean, if not there yet, like Bradley said, definitely very close to that version of himself that was stellar during the 2019 campaign, even at the beginning of the year prior to the pandemic and that uh, in those games against Leon. So it, it was crucial to have that Carlos Vela right now against Cruz Azul and, and especially with what's coming also against America with LAFC being on that side of the bracket that definitely will not be easy but um, they're excited to have their leader in that top shape and I feel also it's it, he's really motivated uh, during this competition you know the first time that he's actually played in Mexico because he's been of course with the national team but he left when he was really young to play in Europe and that's where his career developed. So it's like the first time that he's actually playing against Mexican clubs. So I feel like that's also been special for him and that we've seen that extra that he wants to help the team. He wants to prove himself. He wants to show or like showcase LAFC and the MLS and maybe shed another light to what they're doing. Yeah, no, I, he, he definitely is doing that. He scored uh, in this CCL matchup. He scored three out of five LAFC goals uh, in the in the competition. And, you know, like we know that all the eyes are on Carlos Vela, especially from, you know, from the Mexican national teams and everything. But he's still showcasing to me. He was the best player on the field, you know, just just doing what he did, you know, just dominating winning possession. And you do I do you do see a little bit of extra motivation, not saying that he's not motivated, but you do see it a little bit more because it is Cruz Azul, because we did see Club Leon and now we, we're going to go see him against Club America. If not the biggest club, you know, one th them and Chivas, you know, obviously the biggest clubs and, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, down in Mexico. So, that, I mean, that extra motivation just to see Carlos Vela and to also score, you know, to score on both, you know, Leon, Cruz Azul. And I know he's looking to add uh, Club America to his title. Like you said, like, you know, he grew up in Mexico, but he never played there. And it's just a way to just showcase him, himself, LAFC, and what they got going on. Do you think uh, him being there, like, obviously, uh, we know Chicharito on the other side has not had a successful season. But do you feel like younger players are going to start wanting to come play, who are from Mexico, are going to want to come play in MLS because of players like Carlos Vela? Definitely. And we've seen other examples like Pizarro with Miami, Jurgen Damm that signed with Atlanta. Um, so there, there's definitely more interest of what the MLS can bring or like can represent for them. For example, Pizarro, one of his dreams, of course, is to play in Europe. And he saw more of an opportunity now to maybe, you know, make that jump from MLS 
to Europe in, instead of just staying in the Mexican league because he won everything but with Pachuca, with Chivas, with Monterrey. So he, he wanted a, a different challenge. And, and also he saw maybe a, a more direct line to fulfill that dream. Eventually if things go well for him through Miami, through the MLS to, to get to Europe. Also with, with the connections, maybe, you know, Beckham and, and Miami and all of that. So, so that's an, an example of, of what they're seeing now and what they're thinking. And definitely there's going to be more interest of, of what the MLS can bring for their careers, not just when they're like, older or veteran players in the end of their careers but when they're younger and and they have other goals and expectations as well and you know what what they're seeing in the league the attention also in the media that's growing in in Europe it's a reality and, and we've heard it even Vermeer said it when he just got here that of course the MLS is known more in, in or it's shown more as well in, in Europe or in other places than, for example, the, the Mexican League, you know, because of course it, it's huge for th that particular market, but in, in an international level, uh, MLS, it, it's been growing more. So it, it can definitely um, mean a different window for all of those players. Yeah, and, and just to talk about about younger players, we you know LAFC had the young Ghanaian player Mahala Opoku who came in you know in the 50th minute and he scored the the game winner in the 70 and I think it was the 71st minute off a of volley off the corner kick. Uh, it's just amazing, you know. To me, he wasn't. I wasn't like I said. He wasn't the first sub. I thought I was going to come in. You know, I think all all of us assume it was going to be, uh, you know, Brian Rodriguez. But once we see Mahala, we're like, wow, he must have been doing something in practice or you know different things the last couple of weeks. So Brad Bradley to bring him in over, you know, over Christian Torres, who he, he even started, you know, the last game for the Portland Timbers. So you know, it, it's just exciting to see him come in and impact the game right away. And, you know, also him being 19 years old and, you know, the youth that LAFC has, you know, with players like, you know, Brian, Diego Rossi, who I think is 22, 23 years old, not not that old yet, you know, and then Mahalo, who's 19, gives them the win over Cruz Azul. What do you, what do you make of, of LAFC and how they're developing this young talent that they have? That's been great. Seriously, when you look at what the franchise has been doing, and it's one of the things that's given them success so quickly because it definitely that's one of the factors and the, the scouting that they've done in, in South America and Africa looking for young talent that can grow with the franchise where they can develop them right there and, and maybe you know be players that they're eventually going to export and sell so I, I feel like they've done a really really good job and it's paying off and Bradley has also been I guess the perfect guy to kind of like command that chip and, and show the way for all of these young players so it's paying off like with what with what we saw of Mahala yesterday and if you look at the age medium of the team I mean it's around 23 years old when we're talking about Bella being the captain and one of the veterans at 31 years old because all of the others are the, just youngsters full of talent and uh, they were even saying during the game yesterday because the uh, the eyes and and what they know of LAFC, especially within the media in, in Mexico, it's of course Vela, you know, and it's all about Vela, but they don't maybe know that much more about the team and what they're doing with all of these young players and what they mean and what they represent, you know, like Rossi, like Rodriguez, Atuesta, and, and all of the, the future that those players have. Yeah, no, and they're definitely just showcasing, like you say, obviously, Vela is the, is the star, is a superstar, not just the team, but, you know, essentially probably MLS as well, you know, and they also get to showcase those young talents. And just to go back on Mahala, I don't know, I think you, I don't know if you're still on the call, but like Bob, they asked Bob Bradley about Mahala and kind of some of the backstory. I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase here. He had mentioned Bob Bradley, obviously, he coached the U.S. men's national team, and I believe he also coached the uh, the national team in, in, in Egypt, which is in, in a country in Africa, in the continent of Africa. And he said to him spending his time out in Africa that, you know, he got to see so, so much of the passion there. And then he said that, you know, one of the things that he looks for players is when they, you know, when they um, players that love the game. And he referred to Mahala being a player that that loves the game. And it's, it's just a, exciting just to see him uh, the way he's been able to impact the game and just the, the certain things that have happened uh, for LAFC, for Mahala, for Diego Rossi. They're not just recruiting here in South America, but they're also recruiting, you know, on the other side of the pond, you know, you got Africa and that's going to really 
grow the LAFC brand, not just not just here, like, you know, like south of the border, but just all over and then really get to get to know LAFC all over the world. Um, I was I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, the Club America game, obviously, you know, we know it's going to be a tough one. Um, what do you what are your thoughts of LAFC going in going in and facing Club America? I think it's going to be a great game, an exciting game. And even though America isn't showing their b best version either, we're, we're definitely going to see a different Club America from what we saw against Atlanta because their circumstances, of course, were very different. They did play, you know, that first leg where they had a three goal uh, advantage. So, of course, they weren't the team with the urgency during the second leg. So they were just looking to be more solid to manage the timing of the game and just you know play with that urgency that of course Atlanta had and it ended up you know you know going well for them Ochoa had of course key saves but the truth is that the fans were upset and have been upset lately especially when they lost um, during the quarterfinals in the Mexican playoffs because they don't they don't necessarily like what they've seen of the team lately they they don't like that they're not showing a specific maybe style of play a collectiveness and they're just like kind of like relying on individuality and what players can do especially now they you, they don't even have a full team with four positive cases COVID, uh, players that didn't make the the travel and the trip and then um also injuries you know Gio, Giovanni Dos Santos it's not there with the team he he's injured so um Henry Martin that it's uh one of their important forwards so they're definitely not at their best but it's Club America one of the big teams in Mexico and especially um during a semi-final of an international competition I think it's a team that um that has depth and you can never write off yeah, even I was watching the game. I don't know if you were, but I was watching the game, the Club America versus Atlanta. And Atlanta, Atlanta United, they look, they look really good. They looked, they looked. I mean, obviously they were down 3-0. They had some urgency, but they looked good. They looked uh, at times, you know, um, a little bit better than than Club America. You know, maybe because Club America didn't have the pressure. You know, they're up 3-0. But you know, if you have a better team, a little bit more experienced team, and you have a superstar like Carlos Vela. And, you know, a team that's, you know, starting to hit the rhythm a little bit more that, that prior besides COVID, I don't think LAFC really got into rhythm. They were always up and down. And, you know, in a tournament like this, like you, you can just ride the wave. You're rolling in hot, you come in in hot, you can go all the way to the, to the, to the, to the finals here in the CONCACAF Champions League. And to your point, I know Club America, I know a lot of people, I know a lot of fans have been frustrated with Piojo Herrera. Which is it's crazy to see is to say, but I know they didn't make it all the way to the final, and I know a lot of fans are, are a little bit upset and may want him out, which may be crazy or not crazy to say. But do you feel like uh, Pio Correra is on the hot seat with Club America? I mean, of course, the spotlight it's always on on Club America, and everything is just magnified. You know, whether good or bad, everything's always magnified and it's a hot seat, a hot seat like year round, I feel. But if you look at the numbers, you know, this is um, the second time that Herrera has been America's head coach. And during both his tenures, like he had always made it to the semifinals, except from this tournament where they actually fell to Chivas. So it was like even more painful because it was against the arch rival that they ended up losing in the quarterfinal. So it was the first time that they didn't make it to semifinals, but that tells you about a team that it's constantly just like competing at a top level, even though that for the past two years, um, they've lost players, you know, Uribe, Marchesin, Diego Laines, um, Edson Alvarez, uh, they all went to Europe and um, I'm, I'm missing maybe some Guido Rodriguez, which was in the midfield. It's like they're at Tuesta. Uh, Guido was there at Tuesta. Um, they, they've lost all of these important players. You know, the, the championship team that they had in December 2018 was like slowly dismantled. So it, it's been hard. And, and regardless of all of this, Herrera has found a way to keep the team competitive, you know, in those first places, making it to the playoffs. So, of course, the pressure is always very high and the expectations are always very high with, with Club America. But that's what I'm saying, that 
um, they always find a way to compete that it's a team with depth. So having Herrera, I think it, it's one of their strong points because it, it's a, a coach that of course some love, some hate, but he's, he always finds a way to rally the team. He, he likes to, you know, to have a team with strong mentality. So that's why during a semifinal at an international competition, I wouldn't just like write them off even though they're not at their best level because I, I feel like they have some other ingredients that, that can be key uh, at this stage. Yeah, no, no. And then that makes all of sense. I mean, you are, we've seen what Herrera has done with Club America, but not just Club America, but also the Mexican national team and how he, you know, essentially revived them and picked them up and got them to the, to the, to the world cup. Um, and it, it's going to be an exciting matchup. You have Bob Bradley and Pio Correra, like I said, two former national team head coaches going at it. You also have Carlos Vela, if not the biggest star, you know, the most, one of the most talented players. I know he's not playing for the Mexican national team, but he plays for LAC. He pays, plays for Bob Bradley. And on the other hand, you have Guillermo Ochoa, right? You had, I don't know if you saw that photo of Guillermo Ochoa and Carlos Vela. They hugged each other, like, you know, before, I think uh, before the game and stuff, or before LAFC's game, after Club America's game. Um, you know, that's going to be a fun rivalry. You have Carlos Vela, who's looking to score against Ochoa, and you have Ochoa, who's looking to make some incredible saves. What do you, what do you make of that matchup? Oh, that's definitely going to be an interesting one because, of course, they're friends from their time in the na Mexican national team, from their time playing in Europe when they maybe would get together. So it, it's going to be uh, exciting to see that. They, they know each other as players. So it, it, there's an extra motivation for each side in, in that sense, kind of like when the Galaxy plays LAFC and you know how Jonah and, and Carlos Vela, they're great friends, but when they're on the field, they each want to win for the team. So it's, it's going to be kind of like that. So it's definitely going to be interesting to face off in, in that game. But Gio, like I mentioned, he's injured, so they're not going to be able to just face each other. But um, everyone remembers those great times with the under-17 team that was world champion, uh, the world champions in the under-17 level in 2005 with uh, Giovanni Dos Santos and Carlos Vela being the stars, you know? And that's what um, kind of like brought the attention to them and what made Arsenal sign Vela back then when he was 17 years old. So um, that would have been an interesting story as well, but uh, Ochoa and Carlos Vela, that, that's gonna be good too. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, a, it's unfortunate. I know uh, we saw there was a lot of Galaxy fans on Twitter yesterday. They're like, oh, we got to root for Giovanni Dos Santos in uh, Club America. And I was like, well, wait a second. Gio, Gio Dos Santos is not playing. But that, I mean, that's why I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because that would have been fun to see him, you know, uh, face Carlos Vela and, 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 you know, just those whole matchup would just added a little bit. It would have been just the matchup would have just been a little bit juicier and just to see that, especially in a semifinal. So let me let me ask you this, like, how, how does LAFC beat? Uh, how does it, how does LAFC beat Club America? If not the biggest club, the biggest club in Mexico. I think that they just showed what they showed against Cruz Azul. They have a really good good shot at at winning this because you know having the the tempo and the, that rhythm and that speed that they like that high pressure. Uh, I think that's going to be good. Also, one of the things that um, LAFC has suffered from in the past because of that high pressure, because of, of that wanting to, to go forward. It's, you know, those long balls to the defender's backs that can hurt them, especially when, when Club America has teams, I mean, has players with a lot of experience and that can be uh, very um, certeros, I forgot the word in, in English, but uh, difficult, hard. It can be, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, very that they're not gonna miss in front of goal. You know what I mean? Gotcha, gotcha, so, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So that they definitely have to <laughs> have to take that in into consideration. But uh, I think what what we were saying of Club America not showing maybe that collectiveness, whereas LAFC has been showing that. I think that can definitely be the way for LAFC to to get to the final. Yeah, no, and, and it's, it's going to be quite the task, right? It's Club uh, Club Leon first, Cruz Azul, and if they're able to get past 
uh, Club America, you know, obviously this game's on Saturday. How do you think LAFC's season will be, uh, year, 2020 year? We know the MLS season has ended. But if they're somehow, you know, they're able to get past Club America and into the final, and we, are, we would assume it's going to be Tigres on the other side, but we don't know that for a fact. How do you think the season will, this year, I should say, not season, but this year will look for uh, for LAFC, you know, after everything, the inconsistencies and everything they've had uh, for 2020, you know, obviously they had players in and out due to, you know, the international call-ups. You also had Carlos Vela, who was injured. You also had, you know, COVID cases. And then this crazy year that's been crazy for everybody, including LFC. How would this year look for them to make it to the finals? It would definitely kind of like, I don't, I don't know if I should say save the season because I know it was something, like you said, difficult for everybody. But it'd be really interesting, and I I'd like to see them succeed. Like you said, they're like the only team that's left standing, uh, representing the MLS. So kind of like showcase the growth uh, of the leagues, at being LAFC one of the better teams that we've seen in the past few years. So I think it'd be very special, also because of the rivals that they have and the teams that they beat so far. So I think it, it mean a lot to, you know, kind of like back the, the work that, that they've been doing, like we mentioned with the scouting, with, uh, you know, the, the franchise wanting to have a particular style, the stadium, the fan base, the different elements that, that they've done and, and they've, that they've done really, really well. So I, I think it'd be special kind of like to, sh to showcase that in, in a stage like this. Yeah, yeah, no, I would have to agree with you that. It's just, you know, it, it just goes to show just, you know, in LAC's short career, you know, we've seen glimpses. Obviously, we know they've, they've felt short in the, in, in the MLS Cup uh, playoffs. But, you know, if they're somehow able to, you know, get to the final and win it, you know, to your point, they're going to be able to showcase uh, – you know, the, the national, you know, the, the world's stage on where they want to be and how they, you know, just it's going to give them a lot more to be able to recruit younger players and recruit players to come to LAFC and look, hey, we have 19 year old Mahala who scored this goal. You know, we have Christian Torres, a local Southern California product who's 16 year old. He's playing for us. You also got, you know, a Danny Masewski who came from the USL, you know, those are, you know, you got Duarte Twist and Brian Rodriguez, you know, so it's just, you know, if they're able to get there to the final, obviously, like I said, it's a tough task uh, against Club America. It's really going to, you know, grow the MLS, grow LAFC, grow, you know, obviously the sport here here in America. And it's just, you know, it's just going to be an amazing thing to see. Like, until we're, there's still um, there's still a lot, you know, a lot to be played, though, because you get, it, gets, it gets harder and harder, you know, Cruz Azul. Uh, you know, Club America is another level above Cruz Azul. And then, you know, if you're able to get past Club America, then you got Tigres, who's, you know, obviously been one of the best clubs in the last 10 years for the Liga MX. So hey, the, the, the task is not even easier. And you got Gignac on the other side, you know, playing for Tigres and the way he's been able to score. Um, what, what do you give me some predictions uh, for LAFC? What, what do you think of the scoreline will be? Uh, I, I think it's going to be a close one. I do have LAFC and Tigres in the final. So let's just say 1-0. But I, I do feel it's going to be a, a close one against Club America. But um, I, I feel like LAFC has what it takes to, to make it to the final. Yeah, they got they got they got all their weapons back, and even though, you know, uh, Brian Rodriguez may not be 100 percent healthy, but, you know, they got, you know, just a couple of days, you know, unlike Cruz Azul, they weren't able to game plan. You got you got a short turnaround, you know, game in on Wednesday, got a game plan for Club America on Saturday. So it's going to be it's going to be exciting and a fun one. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, how many goals does Carlos Vela score uh, these next two games if they make it make it past this one? Oh, let's say three in, in two games. <laughs> three in two games. I like that. That's, that's going to, that's going to be a good that's, one. Right? Cause that's, that's, cause that's kind of what he's been showing throughout this competition. So yeah, and it's always like it's keep it going. Yeah, and it's always exciting when you see him score the, the goals and keep it going, you know, um, just to finish up, up here, we know uh, some, you know, LAC players are, you know, are, pretty hot they've been on the market what do, what do you think about 
Brian Rodriguez and Diego Rossi. Do you think they will stay here after this transfer market window? Or, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? It's going to be hard. If it's not this transfer window, definitely during the summer of 2021. I know the pandemic has made it difficult for most clubs and, and the economic blow ha has been um, a hard one. But um, I, I do see them um, you know, like leaving pretty soon or like sooner than later. Uh, because of what they're showing, like we said, the, the young just talent that, that they are and what they represent. So it, that will also be, be good for LAFC, you know, like what we mentioned, because they're establishing a foundation, a culture of how you're supposed to work, how you're supposed to play, and, you know, being a, a professional and, you know, what Mahala showed at his age at a stage like this, it also talks about the mentality and, and everything that, that they're doing you know working with this group of players so that just going to speak wonders and it's going to be really good for the team as well yeah well katya thank you that's all the time we have um for the people that already don't follow you let the people know where, the, where they can follow you uh at katia castorena so k-a-t-i-a-c-a-s-t-o-r-e-n-a -A. so that's pretty much my handle i think on all social media twitter instagram uh, Facebook page, even though I don't use that one as much, but uh, <laughs> yeah. No worries. Yeah, I don't think most of us use Facebook nowadays, but uh, but yeah, so it's Twitter, right. Twitter and Instagram. But yeah, guys, if you guys enjoyed this episode, make sure to give this a five star rating on Apple Podcasts. You can listen to this podcast wherever you get your music. You guys can also follow me on Twitter at Gio Garcia LA. And make sure to check out LA Soccer Hub on all your social media platforms. Uh, for Katya, this is Gio. We'll catch you guys next time. Peace.